Now I'd like to introduce uh, Magdalena Harris, who's going to talk about some further examples of best practice in wrapping services around people who use drugs, but in England this time. Thank and uh, Magdalena is uh, a qualitative sociologist at uh, London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, and very importantly is on the uh, board of the Hepatitis C Trust, and is consequently my boss. Oh yeah, that's right Charles. <laughs> uh, oh, here we go, good stuff. Um, thank you for that fantastic presentation, John. I don't think I can hardly follow that. Um, but what I'm going to do is go into much more of a micro level and look at two services and the things they actually did in those services. So <clears throat> I'm not going to do my overview, I've only got seven minutes. This is based on um, LSHTM research uh, barriers and facilitators study where we looked at hep C treatment provision and drug and alcohol settings. We looked at two London partnerships between um, drug and alcohol services, bloodborne virus nurse teams and hospital hepatology units. And we spoke to 35 people of hep C, of whom 32 were on OST plus service providers. And the people with hep C were at a variety of different stages in their treatment journeys. Okay, so arising from the study and well evidenced in the literature, and as you would have heard John say, there are multiple barriers associated with hospital-based hep C treatment for people who inject drugs. These include complex referral and appointment systems, lengthy waiting times, rigid do not attend policies and eligibility criteria, distance, unfamiliarity, stigma and discrimination. So I, a lot of the people I've spoken to in this study and in other studies have said they've had previous negative experiences in the hospital setting and they will not contemplate going there for hepatitis C treatment. So as Len here says, I wouldn't have gone to hospital for hep C treatment, I was really badly treated, I know lots of people have been treated abysmally down there. So, in response to these barriers, there's been a move in the UK and in other countries to bring hepatitis C treatment into community settings. Now, drug and alcohol services are seen to be more amenable to system modification or system taming than the rigid hospital-based systems. And this could also, I mean, the, the needle and syringe exchange is a, is a wonderful example. You know, I'm just here talking about drug and alcohol services. Um, because this is what we studied, but there's definitely uh, scope for this to move further and further out. So as this nurse here says, hospitals, it's not they won't do it, they can't do it. They can't tailor the system to fit the client. So how did these systems, how did these drug and alcohol services tailor the system to fit the client? What did they do? So I've um, looked at examples of best practice and I've just put them under these three headings of accessible, flexible and responsive um, service provision. So accessible, um, and I'm going to, because I've only got seven minutes, I'm just going to talk about a couple under each heading. So I'll move on to do that. So in order to get people to access the services in the first place, I mean fundamental, and this is a bit of a, you know, a bit of a no-brainer, is it's got to be non-judgmental, non-stigmatising. And so as Eric says, I mean, there was none of this, well, that will teach you to fuck with needles. There was nothing like that. I wouldn't have gone to that service if it hadn't been for her, so that's something in itself. So what we found is individual um, service providers who provided continuity of care, were very non-judgmental, very friendly. They enabled the building of trust and the ability to start these conversations around hepatitis C, hepatitis C treatment, and for people to actually consider going back to that service and starting up this treatment. Also important were that the service was familiar. People were used to going there, getting their OST, um, and they were, they were convenient. If they were multidisciplinary, then they were able to deal with people's needs in a, in a one-stop shop sort of environment. So as Jeff says, it was like killing two birds with one stone. When I came on my fortnightly thing, I'd see my key worker and I'd see my bloodborne virus nurse. And so the services that were successful worked to optimise appointments so that people were seeing you know, when they had to see their key worker, the bloodborne virus nurse would be there to see them at the same time. They didn't have to come twice, you know, it was all done then. It was about getting the person when they came in the door. And another way to do that was to be very flexible around appointment schedules. So uh, what was this nurse here says, it's probably our model of care which is the most effective. It's about being flexible with patients. You set an appointment with a patient, they don't turn up, they can still see us. So a lot of people falling out of the hospital system because of um, DNA policies. If you didn't come for X amount of appointments, that was it. You were back to scratch again. And this is a fundamental barrier for many people who are using. Also um, vitally important was eligibility. 
to be flexible around eligibility and these services were fantastic in that they used individualised assessment with a, a, an acceptance of ongoing drug use and some alcohol use as well. So as the consultant psychiatrist here says, don't care if they're injecting or not injecting, don't care if they're on methadone injecting, etc. We will treat them. And responsive. Many people who are using have other more pressing concerns. Hepatitis C isn't a priority. So what was important for these services and getting people in and getting them talking about hepatitis C was attending to some of these other concerns first, like acute health issues, such as sorting out um, wound care, leg ulcers. Also, um, people had difficulties navigating complex um, bureaucratic systems regarding getting housing and benefits. So for key workers to help them do that, that enabled trust and enabled conversations about other matters like hepatitis C. Also very important was on-site phlebotomy of relaxed protocols that was non-stigmatising and collaborative. For testing, sure you can use dry blood and spot testing, but um, phlebotomy was a major barrier for people to contemplating treatment because you have to take whole blood for treatment, this was an issue. And so it definitely had to be on-site and, um, and relaxed protocols so people could go for blood in the, in the jugular or the, in, um, in the femoral vein and maybe let the service users get it themselves if that's what they preferred. Okay, so um, as has been said, there's incredibly uneven treatment access across the UK and you know, despite nice guidelines saying that uh, injecting shouldn't be a contraindication to treatment, people are still being turned away because of this. So as Shane said, I think their exact words were, it's an expensive drug, you're using on top and we're not treating people who are using because you could get reinfected, couldn't you? You know, and we're in danger of seeing more of this sort of rhetoric with the new drugs. You know, they're going to be easier, they're going to, but they're going to be more expensive. And so it seems to be, you know, something around the targets that um, Scotland has in place could be very useful for this. Getting a hepatologist, calling them to account, saying, right, how many active drug users are you treating and if not, why not? And, and something to help that is also to encourage community engagement, and I think this is incredibly important. This quote from this consultant is very telling. He says, they, people who use drugs, have such low self-esteem, they won't, won't make a fuss, and they really don't jump up and down. down. The idea that tranches of people with hemophilia could not be offered hep C treatment because it was inconvenient or something, it's just an extraordinary concept, and they'd make a huge fuss. But the drug users just accept they're not worth it and they won't go there. You know, and this is fundamental to encourage community empowerment from the ground up, peer involvement and in services, a feeling of ownership, and also, you know, um, so a, a small thing that me and the London Joint Working Group are doing is developing a rights based resource to inform people of injecting of their rights to treatment and what to do if they're denied it. So, you know, small things like this can all make a difference. And, um, I don't think I'm going to have time, but no, says Dee. But I'm very pleased that other people have quickly talked about the need for prevention because uh, it, it is fundamental. We cannot talk about hepatitis C elimination without talking, and, or treatment as prevention, without talking about tr prevention as prevention and the scale up of accessible OST and NSP. And I think I will conclude with that. Thank you very much.